Welcome to the Ortega Path to Enlightenment. My name is George Ortega, and we're recording on August 1st, 2017. This is episode number 14, Enlightenment and Impermanence. Okay, so like again, this is a series on what it is, what is, what is enlightenment? You know, they've, they've talked about it in various forms for several thousand years. Um, how to become enlightened in a certain sense, how to become more enlightened, because I have a feeling it seems like it's something, um, it's a matter of degrees. And, and basically, impermanence is something that, um, that is taught um, definitely within Buddhism, um, I imagine within other spiritual traditions also. And it simply means that, um, that things change. Now, like, I want to kind of like a bit get, in, get into why it's a, an element of enlightenment. Because like, you know, on the surface, I mean, yeah, I mean, come on, things change. Yeah, no doubt, right? But, but um, it, it is, you know, a pretty central theme or element in, in, you know, various kinds of conceptions of enlightenment. So, uh, so we're going to explore it. And I really don't know, how, you know, I'm not sure how much I have to say about it, because, um, but, but we'll see. So, all right, so things, things um, change. They don't stay the same. So then the question becomes, why is this important to know? How can this value our lives? Again, enlightenment is really about three major kinds of um, ways of evolving. Uh, the first way is to, to become happier. Enlightenment, the more enlightened one is, the happier one is. The second dimension of, of enlightenment um, has to do with goodness, you know, ethics. In other words, like, you know, you can't be happy, you can't be enlightened while you're being happy at the expense of others, you know. Um, so, you know, being good, being, and this, this extends not, you know, it extends beyond people to, to animals, you know, like, for example, like, um, we, we are very cruel to, to, tens of billions of animals on our factory farms and in labs and, and zoos and all, you know, across this country and throughout the world. And, you know, that's, again, like, one, one couldn't claim to be enlightened while, while one is, you know, c participating in that, paying people, essentially, to inflict, you know, a lot of pain on, on these animals. So, and then the third component of, of enlightenment is a proper right view of, of reality. In other words, you can't really be very enlightened if you believe that the earth is flat or if you believe we have a free will. <laughs> like almost, I mean, you, you, you see a lot of like people like Deepak Chopra and others on, on the internet who claim to be enlightened, but then they believe in free will. No, <laughs> I mean, you know, somebody could, could be on, on the internet, you know, claiming that they're, for example, like the reincarnation of Jesus or Moses or the Buddha, and they may be right, <laughs> who knows? <laughs> they're probably not, but they may be right. Um, but it's impossible to have a free will. So that, that's how unenlightened this idea of free will is. We've gotten into that. So, all right, so then, so, the impermanence, you know, getting that, that nothing stays the same, everything changes, you know, falls pretty much under this element of or component of enlightenment that, um, that we refer to as, as just, you know, in, in Buddhism it's called the right view, you know, getting things right, understanding reality as, as it is. And again, the, the, the advantage of that, I mean, like everything about Everything is always about happiness. I mean, Aristotle said, like, happiness is the only end in life. Okay, think about it. So that means that everything else is a means. You know, happiness is like, there's nothing, you know, there's nothing that we can do. I mean, certainly we can, like, work to help other people be happy, too. And that, that is a way of our feeling happy also. You know, it's like, it's not like they're mutually exclusive. But, but you know, this, this idea of understanding that nothing is permanent, you know, is, is, is another way of seeing reality in the right way, perceiving it correctly, in order to, um, 
to become happier. Now, I mean, like, you know, having said that, I'm not sure it really matters to one's happiness when, whether one believes the world is flat or not, or whether one believes the, the sun revolves around the earth or we revolve around it, you know. Uh, but, but with impermanence and with, you know, certain topics like free will, it does matter a lot. So, all right, so now the, this, this concept of impermanence is similar to a Buddhist uh, concept of non-attachment. I believe we um, did an episode on that recently, just the idea that we don't want to become attached to anything, really. I mean, like, when Buddha was, was going through the Four Noble Truths, that is the very foundation of Buddhism, you know, the first truth was, like, that there is suffering in life. You know, we live, we suffer. And the second uh, noble truth was that um, our suffering is a result of craving, wanting, desiring. We, we want things. These are attachments. We want things that we don't have. And, and this wanting, you know, is basically the third noble truth is like there's a way. I, actually, Buddha, sh he should have like done, it shouldn't be just four, <laughs> four noble truths. The like, third noble truth is like, well, um, there's a way to overcome this suffering. And the fourth noble truth is the way is the Eightfold Path, right? And it's true, but I think more concisely, he should have said, well, you know, um, the third noble truth should have been, well, the way to overcome this suffering caused by craving is to crave less. To, to you know, if you want, the only thing w that makes sense to want really is the happiness um, of those people we know, the, you know, people in general, uh, sentient beings, and our own happiness, you know, everything else could be maybe seen as a preference. So like the idea is that um, we want to be non-attached. We don't want to crave because things change. For example, like if, we, if our happiness is dependent on whatever it is being the way we want it to be, well, yeah, it may be that way for, for months or years or even decades, but again, things change. And to the extent that we we um, become non-attached because, you know, we, we understand this impermanence, then that will help us, again, to, to not crave, to not want what isn't, all right? So, like, again, things change and what was, you know, we, we were once very young, then we become middle-aged, then we become old, then we die, who knows what happens after that. So, all right. Now, um, this, another, another similar um, theme to, to impermanence it, within Buddhism is this idea in Buddhism that there's no permanent personal self. In other words, like who we were when we were like five years old is vastly different from who we were at 10, 15, 20, and you know, like 30, 40. So like, in other words, like we, we you know, we are not the same person today that we were 10, 15, 20 years or whatever. And like, this is even biological. I mean, like our cells kind of like regenerate. They, you know, we, our blood cells, our skin cells, our organ cells, they, they each die and they're replaced by new cells in each organ. And like, um, it's estimated like every seven years or so, we're just like completely new. So, so this is like, but, but within the, the, this Buddhist idea of personal self, um, again, it's, it's an element of, of enlightenment and, and, and in terms of kind of like understanding why it's helpful to understand that we don't have a personal self, um, I guess relative also to impermanence, is that um, to the extent we, we believe we have a personal self, well, actually, I'm not sure this is going to be about impermanence so much, but when we believe that we have a personal self, and like when you understand that nobody has a free will, you know, this whole concept of a personal self just shifts tr tr dramatically because like, you know, we, for example, like right now I'm saying stuff, all right, before anything that I'm saying, I have no idea what I'm going to be saying. I have a kind of an idea, but even that kind of idea, uh, that inkling of what I'm going to say, just comes into my mind. And then the words come. Right now you're thinking whatever you're thinking about what I'm saying, and you go throughout your days thinking thoughts. They just come into your mind. So basically, like, we, we generally think of ourselves 
as the thinker when we're actually just like we're we're just the, like a radio receiver or a television receiver. We're, we're receiving these thoughts, impressions, feelings, and stuff, and experiencing them. So, but in terms of like, how do you how do you relate this personal self? Well, the idea I got right. So, like, um, in addition to it not really being we who think, it's like we are kind of like experiencing whatever we think and feel and experience. Um, that changes again. Um, according to how how old we are you know as an adult we're going to like perceive the world much differently than um not the, not just the world we're going to perceive ourselves you know who we are and again that's a confusing concept but you know differently with each year with each decade so that that's that's how it relates to impermanence so basically it's not just that the world changes but it's we however we want to conceptualize this this I that, that that forms us because we can conceptualize it certainly in, in different ways that changes also you know we're we're actually not separated from the rest of the world so as the world changes we change as we change the world changes all right so okay so yes yeah, so the idea part of this is like this impermanence I, I you would think that to to benefit from the wisdom of it, it's part of it is to understand that, um, and this is something I learned when I was practicing Orthodox Judaism several decades ago, um, that when you lose something, you generally gain something. I think there's an expression that when, when God closes one door, he opens a window or something like that. You know, and, and that's true, you know, in other words, like, when we're young, there, there are definitely benefits to being young. You know, again, but because of this impermanence, we don't stay young. Uh, we lose our innocence. We lose, um, you know, a lot of joy that comes from our innocence. The less we know about the world sometimes, the easier it is to feel really happy. All right, so we lose that as we get older. But, you know, like when we're really, really young, it's not like much is up to us. I mean, nothing is up to us. We don't have a free will anyhow, but like there's much more of a, you know, I mean, like, you know, young kids are controlled by their parents and, you know, and so like, you know, the older we get, the more quote unquote control we have over our lives. And I think, you know, when we're really young, there's not much we understand. And that lack of understanding, fine, you know, sometimes it can create greater joy, you know, if we kind of like aren't aware of all the, you know, the unkind things in the world. But it also can create a lot of confusion, you know. So like the older we get, the, 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 the more, you know, as we lose our, our youth, we gain in experience and we gain in knowledge and we gain in understanding of the world. So like, you know, again, this, you know, the, the, this impermanence, you know, when, when viewed in the right way, leads us to understand that, that it's a good thing, that, you know, that in other words, if we can, if, if, we, if we didn't think about impermanence at all, if we expected things to say, stay the same, not only would we, you know, kind of like, bemoan what we what we lost what what isn't with us anymore what we we also wouldn't be able to you know prepare for and i think properly appreciate you know what we gain as we lose whatever we lose so um another, the other things we we lose again are like material objects you know we might grow up living in the house with our parents whatever and then we move in an apartment things like that um, we lose, you know, we might move, well, this again, this is impermanence. We, we move from one place to the next and, um, and everything changes. But, you know, again, like uh, changes uh, provide for opportunities. Okay, um, now let's relate this to happiness because um, happiness is what enlightenment's about. I mean, that's, you know, like the purpose of Understanding enlightenment, the purpose of becoming enlightened, becoming more enlightened, is again either to become happier oneself or to help others, including animals, you know, become happier. So the idea is, if we if we make our happiness dependent 
on this external reality, even on dependent on, on ourselves. If we, you know, for example, if our happiness is dependent upon our being young, if our happiness is dependent on the world, you know, being a certain way, that's not a very wise way to, to achieve our happiness, to sustain it because of this impermanence, because we're not going to stay, you know, very young, <laughs> you know, and the world isn't going to stay the same. We've got, we've got half the country still in shock because this, this guy Trump got elected. You know, I mean, things that, that uh, we wouldn't expect and we don't want to happen, whatever, um, happen. And so, so, you know, so the idea is like when we recognize, fine, we can't control that we're going to change, that the world's going to change, then that leads us to understand, well, let's base our happiness on something that isn't related to what's external to us and what we can't control, what's going to change, you know, including within ourselves. So, I mean, I'm not sure if I should get this um, into this too deeply because this is, you know, again, uh, an episode more on impermanence than happiness, but just very quickly, basically, um, I've, I'm, I've got to do another show on this because it's important. I think I introduced it in previous episodes. But, you know, my belief is that the most enlightened, the wisest way to obtain one's happiness, again, it has nothing to do with things being the way they are or expecting them or wanting them to. Uh, it's basically like happiness. Feeling happy is a skill. You know, and the skill really is like literally getting in touch with that feeling of happiness. If you're an actor, you know, you, you kind of like learn how to do that. You're, you're, um, you're called upon, your role is that of a person, you know, being sad, you become sad. If you're supposed to be afraid, you become afraid. So you, 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 you summon those emotions, right? And happiness is no different. You know, if you, if you were like in a movie or a play and you were called upon to play, let's say, the Buddha, some enlightened, blissed out character throughout a lot of scenes, a lot of, you know, acts and all, you would be able to generate that. And yes, the, here's the thing. So like with happiness, it may at first seem like you're acting, like you're pretending, like, like it's not real. But anybody who's acted, you know, can tell you that, no, pretty, pretty soon after you start acting a certain way, you begin to feel that way. So again, this is like, so you're not relying on things staying the same, on the external world staying the same, on you staying the same. You're simply relying on your ability to get better and better at tapping into this feeling of happiness, maintaining it, and then strengthening it. Like, you know, you go to the gym, you know, like, you know, make more effort to, to, to raise a... Um, uh, heavier weight, you know, you, you want to be happier, you make more effort to be happier, okay? Um, and, um, and I guess w one other thing, again, it doesn't really relate all that much to impermanence, but, you know, that's how to, like, you know, access th the happiness. Then you also want to, like, minimize the negative emotions, which generally the negative emotions are fear, sadness, and anger. And, and the way you do that is... Um, you know, you could, the way most people do it is like, there's about a million things that make us afraid, sad, or angry. And we generally, most of us are conditioned or taught in society to have a different answer to each of these things that are happening, right? But, but I realized not, not too long ago that you can just generalize all this. You know, if, if you kind of like realize and acknowledge and remind yourself that becoming hap uh, sad, angry, or fearful is in a sustained manner, okay? Um, it's, it's not necessary, okay? You know, there's two situations. One person becomes afraid, one doesn't. One person becomes sad, one, do one doesn't. That tells you it's not necessary. It's not helpful. Usually, you know, when we become, when we feel these negative emotions, it doesn't help us deal with whatever, you know, may need to, to happen, you know, like let's say um, we need to, I don't know, go, um, we need to move to a different city or something, I don't know, and, and we, you know, that, that's causing apprehension. Well, that's not going to help us do what we have to do, so it usually distracts us. So, so these unpleasant emotions aren't helpful, and they actually usually just make things worse, you know, because like, 
when you when you learn when you if you're if you're trying to deal with whatever you're dealing with and you're feeling these emotions these emotions are going to distract you from when you, what you need to do whereas like if you just remind yourself and get into the habit of it so you don't you know it's automatic you have to I'm getting good good at this actually I started this you know maybe 3 months ago and you know it it just it it just um it becomes a more of an automatic response and and so basically you just like you start feeling any kind of negative emotion and you you remind oh yeah it's not you know necessary helpful usually make things worse and all of a sudden you have a very strong reason to not feel them okay so you know that's a bit of a distraction from this impermanence thing but but it's important okay um well actually how 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 impermanence does for most people again relate right to happiness and again this if if you derive your happiness in the way i just described then this wouldn't apply as much to you but you know if you're you know achieving your happiness in more conventional ways then you got to realize you know like the 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 uh, happiness of a 6 year old is going to for example be much different than the happiness of a 30 year old and much different than the happiness of a 60 year old and all so so that's that's where this kind of like understanding of impermanence so like in other words like you can't expect you know from conventional methods to to basically um say oh I know how to be happy and you know I don't have to learn that again so in other words like in in conventional means you've got to like you know you you base on some things I think are common to all ages but a lot a lot isn't you know for example a 6 year old might really enjoy playing with their you know toys or something where a 6 year old probably wouldn't I mean maybe, <laughs> maybe they would I don't know but um but the idea is in a lot in at least some ways there is a difference and when you prepare for that difference when you know when you don't kind of like wrongly assume or want or believe that things are pretty much going to stay the same then you're constantly seeking the to understand the world your your uh, your new being your your you know that's that's different from your previous being and the the world being different from when, the way it was and then just kind of like develop these new ways of 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 achieving your happiness in that way all right now what's interesting is like sometimes you know so things are impermanent and sometimes we can't in general i mean we can guess but a lot of times we don't know whether something that happens is going to be in our best interest or not um there's the there's a famous parable that kind of explains this there's this this guy whose son is given a horse and and three of his neighbors um go to him and ask well you know they 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 first say oh wow that's great i i guess that was a good thing huh and thinking that well, why wouldn't it be good to be given a horse <laughs> and and so what happens is so like the kid is riding the horse falls off, falls off breaks his leg or his arm whatever different different versions of the story so anyway so then the the neighbors go back to the guy and say oh well yeah i i guess it was a bad thing huh and and the guy again says well we'll see you know so then what happens is the region you know is just kind of like pulled in some kind of war or whatever and the, the the kid is about 16 17 and his the kids his age generally are, you know they get drafted all off and listed to to fight this war a lot of them get really really hurt or die and this kid is saved from that because of his broken leg he can't fight the war so then you know the guys come back i guess it you know it was a good thing and you know again this this can, so we never know so things change and um and because we never know what's going to be in our interest and our best interest or not then it doesn't make sense to bemoan changes that appear like they're not in our best interest you know this is kind of like the the uh, attitude of optimism optimism the, the attitude of kind of like you know feeling hopeful about the future that whether we don't know you know things that that don't seem to be in our favor turn out to be in our favor and, and vice versa So all right that's a that's an important um component. We've got about 2 and 1/2 minutes left. Now all right so here's the thing so like a lot changes right but does everything change? Um for example does virtue change is 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 um 
And, you know, there are different kinds. Sometimes virtue is relative. You know, what may be good in one situation may not be good in another. But if it's good in this one situation, is it always going to be good in that uh, one situation? Um, something that doesn't seem, at least according to our best science, physics at the time, to change um, are the laws of nature. I mean, we have these laws of nature like gravity, uh, causality, you know, the, the, uh, the different forces, electromag electromagnetism, and, and these, these laws govern the world. So like what happens is these laws don't change, right? But they cause change. So, you know, it, it seems like some things really do stay the same. I'm not really sure how that would help one's happiness to, to know that, but, but it's, you know, it's an interesting thing to know. Okay, so, so again, yeah, the, going back to the utility of this. So like to the extent that you understand that things are going to change, you know, things are not going to stay the same, you don't become attached to the way things are. You're more open to change. You know, you pr prepare yourself better to, for change. You don't fear it as much. You know, like, it's kind of like wise. Like, we're all going to die. I mean, like, this guy, Kurzweil, Ray, Ray Kurzweil, he's a futurist. He works for Google. He pops about 100 pills every day because, like, in about 30 years or so, people may be able to live indefinitely because they'll be able to like stop or reverse the aging process. And he wants, he's about like 70 now. I don't know if he's going to make it, but he, he may. So, but, but we, otherwise we're all going to die. That's a change. So, all right. So this, again, to the extent we understand that things change, things are impermanent, we can live our lives in a more wise way, you know, and that will lead to us um, becoming happier. And as we become happier, we can help Others become happier and create a much happier and more enlightened world. Okay, thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.